All right, welcome everyone. We're right at five o'clock. We wanna get started to make good use of your time this evening. My name is Rebecca Smith Aldridge. I'm the executive director of the Mid Hudson Library System. And we're so pleased that you're here this evening to hear from one of the best speakers I've ever seen on this topic. Uh, you're in for a real treat tonight. So we're here for effective meetings utilizing parliamentary procedure. This is a webinar that's been brought to you thanks to a partnership with the Public Library System Directors Organization of New York State, also known as POLISDO, and the Library Trustee Association section of the New York Library Association, lovingly known as LTA here in New York. So tonight what we're gonna do, you're gonna uh, hear from Sarah Glagowski, who is the chair, the 2022 chair of POLISDO, who will introduce our speaker. Mr. Adrian Stratton will speak for uh, the majority of our, our webinar are here today and then we're going to have questions and answers so if you've got a burning issue or something Mr. Stratton says piques your interest or you want to know more you can use the question and answer feature here on zoom to send in your question and we'll have a moderated session of questions that will be managed by Sarah Dallas the executive director of the Southern Adirondack Library System so again any technical issues please use chat and questions and answers please use the Q&A feature Sarah, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Sarah is our chair of Polisdo this year. She made this webinar happen. Uh, and Sarah is the executive director of the Finger Lakes Library System. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm so happy that all library staff, directors and trustees throughout New York can join us tonight. I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Adrian Stratton. He is a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians and the American Institute of Parliamentarians. Mr. Stratton advises organizations on procedure and governance and has conducted numerous workshops on diverse for diverse participants on uh, procedure and governance. His ideas on parliamentary law have been published in several journals, including the National Parliamentarian and the Parliamentary Journal. Mr. Stratton currently is president of the New York Association of Parliamentarians and was recently named the parliamentarian for the American Library Association. Adrian, we are so happy to have you with us tonight and we'll get started with you. Thanks. Thank you so much for the warm introduction and thank you everyone who um, is joining us live and who will be reviewing this recording at a later date. I will share my screen and we'll get right into the presentation. I do know that there are many um, individuals at various levels of understanding of parliamentary procedure, and I do hope that there is something for everyone tonight. Um, so before I begin, if I could just get a thumbs up or a confirmation that my slides are um, able to be seen and that I'm coming across okay. Either Sarah or Rebecca, is everything good? Okay, we got a yes. All right, so we'll jump right into it. So this presentation is one that I personally think is um, helpful for a number of reasons. We're gonna talk about a number of topics so the goal isn't really to go deep in this presentation, but it's to go wide. Um, I would like for individuals in real time to place any questions or thoughts that they may have in the Q&A, um, reserve the chat for um, any technical issues or any informal conversation, but we do wanna revisit the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So feel free to make it interactive. As mentioned, my name is Adrian Stratton. I'm a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians, as well as the American Institute of Parliamentarians. And I'm so happy to be speaking um, to New York librarians. I am the parliamentarian for the American Library Association. And I also serve in a volunteer capacity as the president of the New York Association of Parliamentarians. So I don't know if any of my fellow um, New York Association of Parliamentarians members are on, if so. Send me a note in the chat. Welcome. And for anyone who's interested in joining either the National Association of Parliamentarians, the American Institute of Parliamentarians, or the New York Association of Parliamentarians, I would be happy um, to um, share more information with you about that. Um, I do contribute quite frequently to the parliamentary community. I've written several articles. Um, my favorite article was Virtual Deliberative Participation. I wrote that article, and this should be um, something that we all can relate to. Back in March of 2020, um, the city was going through a pandemic, and I started getting a number of phone calls from clients asking how they could conduct business. So I was able to share my experiences, um, unfortunately, um, ahead of the rest of the country, and a lot of parliamentarians, some used the framework that was developed there with their clients as they managed through 
um, the hybrid environment. All of my published articles can be found um, with a link that I'll share later on my Medium um, platform. And I hope that you'll take a visit and read them if you have an interest in some of the topics that I present tonight. So here's the agenda, the rough agenda. So it's five parts. We're gonna have a brief, but you know, you know, really, really specific overview around what parliamentary procedure is. We'll get into the meat of the presentation, which is meetings, the reason why you're all here, how to make them more effective, tips, tricks, and obviously any questions that you may have, transacting business, resources, which will be very brief, and then I want to allocate maybe 15 to 20 minutes or so for Q&A. I do realize that there are a number of people who have joined, which is great, and we may not be able to get to everyone. Um, I will leave my contact information. Um, if you have any specific questions that we can't get to, I would love to address them at a later time. So part one, um, parliamentary procedure overview, goals, concepts, and rights. This is one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite parliamentary authors, and it states, the goals of every member in a meeting should be to understand the issues, to debate freely those issues when debate is appropriate, to express their views clearly, and to make certain that their votes are counted correctly. And that's from Hugh Cannon. Hugh Cannon um, wrote a book uh, on parliamentary procedure that I use quite frequently. Even though Roberts is the most popular book on parliamentary procedure, there are a number of authors who have really thought about this experiment in self-government. And when we think about parliamentary procedure, it's really around democracy. Um, I tell my clients quite often, if you want to have efficient meetings, elect a dictator, right? E e democracy is noisy, it's loud, it's messy, it's something where it requires engagement. And parliamentary procedure provides a way for individuals to reconcile that disconnect, that chaos, into something where it's fair. So on a scale of one to five, with one being not comfortable at all, or five being extremely comfortable, how comfortable are you with parliamentary procedure? And I would like for everyone who's available using a device where they can to place that into the chat so I can get a feel for how comfortable individuals are. Seeing some ones, seeing some fives. Well, it's good to know those fives if my computer goes down, you, you're, you're, you're um, going to be appointed to take over for me. So thank you for that. See some threes, see some fours. So a good mix. So we have a lot of individuals leaning more towards the ones and twos, a good mix of threes and a number of fives. So for the fives, I hope this reinforces what you already know. For the ones and twos, we hope that that increases. And I hope tonight, you know, there's something for everyone. Despite your level of comfort, I would like for you to um, take a step back and maybe unlearn some of the things that you may have learned or compare it to things you may have learned and, and, and really approach this with fresh eyes and fresh thinking um, so that we can all get the best benefit out of it. So what is parliamentary law? It's known by several names. When we talk about parliamentary law, um, it's really interchangeable with parliamentary procedure, parliamentary practice, and rules of order. So when we mention those things, parliamentary law, parliamentary procedure, rules of order, or parliamentary practice, we're all talking about this construct of how to create fairness in democracy in meetings. We know that parliamentary law is subordinate to applicable jurisdictional law. So in your bylaws, you can't do something that is in conflict with federal or state law. Um, your subordinate, your bylaws are subordinate to that. If you have a parent organization, um, your bylaws are support, subordinate to that. So that's really important when you're writing rules to remember the order of precedence. And whether you've adopted bylaws or not, and I'm pretty sure this group of distinguished professionals has adopted bylaws in most of your organizations, regardless, there's a common parliamentary law that is established and that we all utilize whether we know it or not. Some principles to consider, another great parliamentary author, George Demeter, had five principles that he considered so fundamental to parliamentary procedure and parliamentary law that he stated them as such. It's order, equality, justice, minority rights, and majority rule. And when we think about these concepts, um, it helps to begin to frame the discussion of why we use parliamentary procedure and then how we can use parliamentary procedure to have more effective meetings. 
looking at order, we know that chaos thrives in the absence of order. We know that rules can establish common expectations amongst members and that fairness is a goal of parliamentary order. It's not about power per se, but it's about maintaining fairness so that everyone can participate in the parliamentary process. Equality assumes that everyone is equal from the presiding officer to the treasurer or secretary to the new member. Everyone has one vote. Everyone's allowed to participate. And we'll talk about the basic rights of members um, all throughout this presentation. Equality also invites inclusion. When we think about diversity of thought and opinion, parliamentary procedure really allows for everyone to be invited to the discussion and to participate. And sometimes equality means proportionality. Um, for my clients that are not not-for-profits or not social or civic organizations, um, it is fair that votes are counted based on the number of shares they may hold or some other metrics. So proportionality can also lead to equality, and that's worth noting. Justice means justice for all, and that proceedings are impartial. So once again, whether it's the presiding officer or a new member or an established member, everyone is treated fairly and that the rules are applied consistently. One thing um, that I generally stress in talking with organizations is that organizations are made of people. And because people are, are not perfect, organizations are not perfect. Sometimes organizations simply get it wrong. A majority of people can be wrong. That's a fact of life. However, justice assumes that at some point that wrong can be corrected. And that's what we speak about here in this principle around justice. And each organization ultimately decides for itself the interpretation of its rules. Minority rights is something that's, you know, out of all of these, the five, I say the most important in that um, regardless of where one sits on an opinion, sometimes you're with the majority, sometimes you're with the minority of opinion, but everyone's entitled to the basic rights of memberships. And that minority opinion is critical to uncovering some key concepts. Oftentimes it's that diverse thought, that individual who's in the minority that has the best solution. And if we stifle that in our organizations or we create environments where that's not allowed to be expressed, we could be missing out on a key breakthrough. And obviously in democratic societies, um, we promote free speech. Um, Again, hate speech, violence, or the threat of violence, that has no place in a um, parliamentary setting. But when we're talking about debating ideas and really getting to solutions, you want to make sure that people, members are encouraged to really exercise that notion of free speech. After all is said and done, the organization has the right to rule by a majority. And majority means more than half. Sometimes I'll get calls from clients expressing that there was a tie vote and that a motion passed because of that. And we know that a tie is not more than half. If you have 100 individuals and 50 vote for favor and 50 vote against, that motion fails because it was not a majority. You would need at least 51 to have a majority. So very important to remember. Um, typically, a majority is those who are present and vote um, voting is a privilege. You can't force individuals to vote unless obviously it's a rule and be very cautious over high voting thresholds. Now, I know it's early in the presentation, but this is one that I move up and I talk about twice in case individuals have to leave or just to emphasize the point that high voting thresholds don't always mean you get a better outcome. And I'll illustrate with an example. In this case, we have majority, two thirds or unanimous vote. So in a majority vote, you simply need a simple majority. If 51 people out of 100 vote for a measure, it passes. If 51 people vote against the measure, it fails. Very simple, very easy math. When we move to two thirds, however, and you have 100 individuals, um, only 34 people are needed to prevent a motion from being adopted. So there's a much higher threshold. So let's say um, I'm talking in this presentation, and this was a meeting, and a majority of individuals decided that we wanted to end this meeting, and we were in a business setting. If we were using a two-thirds vote, a majority could not stop that. 
because a minority of individuals would be allowed to block the majority. So something to think about when you're writing rules, a two thirds vote, a majority, a minority, excuse me, is allowed to block the will of the majority. And it gets even worse when we look at unanimous vote. All it takes is one individual to block 99 people when we look at a vote. So once again, we'll revisit that a little bit later when we get to the voting portion, but I wanted to flag it now. Just be very cautious in your bylaws over high voting thresholds. So the four basic rights of membership. This is really where we start to get into the need for rules and how to construct rules because all of the rules that you have currently in your bylaws and all the rules that you will create in your bylaws, your standing rules, your policy manuals will come from one of these four elements. So you look at the right of members. The first and the fundamental basic right is to attend meetings. Meetings are where individuals are able to transact business. The next is in those meetings, they're actually able to make motions. We know that individuals in a deliberative assembly um, have the right to participate in debate. That is fundamental. And then individuals have a right to vote. So again, the four basic rights of membership are that a member may attend the meeting, um, they may make a motion, they may debate, and they may vote. Obviously, um, you'll hear me say this throughout the presentation, there's always exceptions to the rule. If your bylaws state, for instance, that honorary members um, cannot participate in debate, but they can vote, that is an exception, and that's based on your bylaws. But absent such a rule, absent anything that's stated and written in either your bylaws or your policy manual or some other special rule every member has the right to attend meetings every member has the right to make motions every member has the right to debate every member has the right to vote even if they're um, in the minority if they're in the majority if they're disruptive you have to create rules to manage your meeting environment you simply can't take away these four rights without having a rule that allows you to do so. So Robert's Rules of Order really provides a great guide um, for, I would say, 80 to 90 percent of the organizations that are out there. Obviously, that would be self-disclosure. No one's done a recent study in 10 years or so, but Robert's is what most individuals use. But there is no single authority on the subject of parliamentary procedure. There's many books on parliamentary procedure, and there's many parliamentary authorities. Um, I referenced Canons earlier, which is a really good one. I'll send out a book list that contains Demeters, as well as the American Institute Standard Code of Parliamentary Procedure, all great books um, that have value and have merit. But Roberts is probably the most comprehensive. Um, in speaking to a group of librarians, I know that um, I can share with you and you will understand that Roberts is a reference book. Just like someone learning English wouldn't pick up a dictionary and read it from beginning to end, I wouldn't recommend any new student of parliamentary procedure to pick up Roberts Rules of Order and read it from cover to cover. As a professional parliamentarian, I've done it and it was even a struggle. But the way to use Roberts is during a meeting, if you have an issue, to use it as a reference, to look up an anticipated issue before you get to a meeting, and to use it as a guide for any situation you may have. Parliamentary authorities, whether it's Roberts or another book, are always subordinate to bylaws. Sometimes individuals think it's the reverse, that the bylaws must conform to Roberts, but that's not the case. Roberts is the reference that contains all of the rules that are not within your bylaws. So if you want to conflict with Roberts or supersede Roberts, you can do that in your bylaws. These two books um, are the latest published editions um, of Roberts. The one on the right is the actual Roberts Rules of Order newly revised. It's in its 12th edition, the most recent edition. Um, that white cover came out in August 2020. There's also an abbreviated version that I personally use and I highly recommend. It's around $10. You can find it on any online bookstore or any bookstore. And it's probably a great investment for anyone who wants to have an approachable entry into parliamentary procedure. Um, it provides basics around member management, how to preside, simple motions. And it, it's just a great resource. I can't um, say that enough. 
I recommend you buy both because um, you never know when you're going to have that unique situation that only Roberts has described. That's not going to be in the brief version, but both have their um, their uses. And I recommend at least you get the in brief version when you're starting out and learning parliamentary procedure. Some key definitions that we'll go over now and use throughout the presentation. The first, a charter, and that's the official document or creation of an organization. It may be issued from a state or even a parent organization. The key there is that it comes from a higher authority. Um, charters, for instance, establish what the name of an organization is. Um, that's something that can't be changed um, without an official change to the charter. Bylaws are the highest internal rules an organization has decided for itself. So whereas the charter is something that's given to the organization, the bylaws are something that can be amended within the organization. Underneath the bylaws, there are special rules. Those rules supersede anything in the parliamentary authority. The parliamentary authority sits in between special rules and standing rules. And then we have standing rules. Standing rules are rules related to the details of administration rather than to parliamentary procedure. When I review bylaws for organizations, that's probably the biggest um, issue I see is that rules that should be separated as policy or standing rules are actually rules that are in the bylaws. And we all know that changing the bylaws requires amending the bylaws. So organizations become very slow and very um, difficult to operate because everything's in the bylaws and the bylaws can never get changed or there's a long process by which the bylaws have to be amended. So one quick thing we all can do to make our organizations run more efficiently and run a little bit smoother would be to look at the bylaws, to make sure the bylaws are at a minimum, they contain the most important rules, but only the rules that um, you want to have some sort of um, permanent connection to the operations of the organization, and then put everything else as either a special rule or a standing rule. Other key definitions, deliberative assembly. Um, there's five basic types, the legislative body, the mass meeting, the board, the convention, and the regular meeting of a society. Um, most individuals are familiar with boards and conventions and even regular societies of a larger nationwide or statewide network. Um, the mass meeting is probably the um, one individuals are least familiar with. That's simply a group of people coming together with the idea of creating something. And the legislative body, we're all familiar with um, that um, from our federal government, from our state governments, um, all of those with the exception of the legislative um, group typically use a book like Robert's Rules of Order. Legislative groups typically develop their own parliamentary authorities. Quorum is a concept you should be very familiar with. It's the minimum number of members necessary to transact business. Without a quorum, only limited action may be take, taken. Effectively, if you're in a meeting and there's no quorum, the most you can do is make a phone call to try to get quorum or um, to decide on when the organization will meet again. A recess is a formal break. It is not in the meeting. Um, that's another one of those confusing parliamentary terms because in, um, I know our federal government at least, to recess, Congress takes a summer recess, um, and that's appropriate because their standing rules, recess means something different. But in our volunteer associations, in our societies, recess is simply a short break with the um, purpose of coming back to conclude business. Adjournment is the formal ending of a meeting. So that's when it's officially done. And that only requires a majority to end a meeting or at the conclusion of an adopted agenda or business, it's assumed that the meeting is adjourned. So next we're gonna get into meetings, their purpose, obstacles, order of business and participants. So the fun stuff. A prime value of parliamentary procedure is that it provides processes through which an organization, large or small, can work out satisfactory solutions to the greatest number of questions in the least amount of time. And the key there is the least amount of time. Parliamentary procedure, when it works well, actually helps to speed things up. 
often individuals have bad experiences with parliamentary procedure because a lot of time is spent in meetings arguing over what procedure is or is not, or it becomes a training exercise, which is not the place in the meeting. But when used correctly, it makes meetings go smoothly um, when everyone is in agreement and it allows the organization to come to decisions fairly when issues are bitterly contested. And that's a key takeaway. When things are going well and everyone understands procedure, there's really little use for some of the more advanced techniques that parliamentary procedure has to offer. But when things are not going smooth and there's um, debate or there's division within the assembly, we build in all these rules to allow for a fair conclusion um, to dispose of the matters before the organization. So once again, on the four basic rights of membership, we know that first and foremost, attending meetings is a basic right. And meetings are simply held for the purpose of conducting business. Social aspects aside or other elements that may be um, involved with the actual gathering of members, the purpose of a meeting from a parliamentary standpoint is to conduct business. Meetings are just formal ways to share information and to take action. Um, because of COVID, there's been a increasing trend to transact business via email or some other alternate mean. And while that is helpful at times, um, business should be transacted in a business meeting unless your bylaws prescribe otherwise. So for instance, if it's your practice in your organization to approve an amendment to the budget, by everyone responding via email. That's perfectly fine, but the rules should be spelled out in your bylaws so that everyone's clear on what that mechan mechanism is and how they can actually interact or raise an issue or concern via email during that vote. Effective meetings accomplish stated purposes. They start and end on time unless agreed by participants. We know that meetings can be extended and everyone is treated fairly. Effective meetings boost morale. I personally um, do not enjoy going to meetings where you know I'm not being heard or I don't feel a part of the um, conversation or it's not productive. You know, someone's controlling the meeting. There's really no order. There's a lot of chaos. For me, that's very difficult, and I'm sure for a number of you, it's also difficult. So, if you want to have better meetings, create better rules so that everyone understands how to interact throughout the meeting, having that parliamentary decorum. Now, I, I won't tell you that creating a rule means that everyone will follow it, but if people and your members understand the rules, you have a better chance for that engagement and that commitment to following the established protocols. And again, in red, parliamentary procedure assists with creating the fair environment that we're all looking for in our interactions. This comes straight from the National Association of Parliamentarians body of knowledge, and it states that a leader should know that, you know, the rules of debate and how to debate is conducted. That's something a leader should know how to maintain order when presiding the duty of the chair to remain publicly impartial while presiding the chair's responsibility to ensure that all members know what is being debated on and rules and limitations regarding electronic meetings. So with regard to the public impartiality, most presiding officers um, are members of the organizations where they serve. And they certainly can have an opinion unless the rules prescribe otherwise, they certainly can vote. But due to their role of presiding over the assembly, they should be publicly impartial. Um, in another meeting, we could talk about tips and strategies on how a presiding officer can maneuver um, and express their opinion without you know, shielding that impartiality, but they should be publicly impartial. One of the core responsibilities of a chair is ensuring all members know what is being debated and what is being voted on. I can't tell you how much time is lost um, when members don't understand what it is they're being asked to do. And a good chair should always keep in front of the assembly what's the motion is, what point they're at in the motion, what's being debated, and then ultimately what they will vote on. 
A leader should be able to demonstrate effective and efficient presiding techniques, process of main motion. Again, we're not asking all of our um, presiding officers to know Roberts back and forth, but the basic motions, basic amendments, that's something anyone aspiring to leadership or being appointed in a leadership role with regard to presiding should know. A leader should be able to limit or extend the limits of debate. So if the meeting's scheduled for an hour and there's more business to be done, a chair should know how to extend that or members should be able to assist with that. The motion to reconsider, rescind, and amend something previously adopted, those are all advanced parliamentary techniques, but there are times when um, an assembly should go back and those motions we'll cover in a little bit, but go back into the past and change something. And obviously handling points of order or appeals and motions to suspend the rules. These are all things that a leader and a presiding officer should be able to do. So the order of business in a meeting, um, in an organization is critical to creating that effective meeting environment. You can think of the order of business as almost like a menu of categories by which an agenda can be built. So if you were to look at this, um, obviously members need to be notified that a meeting is happening. Sometimes in bylaws it's prescribed as the first Monday of the month or every third Tuesday, whatever it is for you. Um, members should know or expect to know when meetings will happen. And once the meeting is notified and properly given to the members, there's a call to order. We talked about quorum earlier, so there would need to be a minimum number of members there to actually participate in the business. If you have minutes, they could be approved. Reports and officers and committees can be reviewed and voted upon if necessary. Special committee reports, if you have them, can be discussed. Special orders is something a lot of organizations don't necessarily use, but I'll give an example. Unfinished business is not old business, but simply business that has been postponed or held over from a previous meeting, and then new business. As mentioned previously, once all of that is done, the meeting either is voted upon to be adjourned or it simply adjourns because there's no further business. So in thinking about that concept of um, a menu or category selection to build an agenda, here's an example. So let's say we were an assembly and we met last month on September 27th. Um, at this meeting tonight, we could approve the minutes from September 27th. Um, we could hear from the president then and the treasurer via reports, as well as the bylaws committee. And the key here, when you look at the order of business on the left-hand side versus the specific meeting agenda, if there's an officer who does not have a report, there's no need to put them on the agenda. You're just slowing down time and you're creating extra work when there's really nothing um, needed from that particular officer. So I would highly recommend, unless there's a report to be given, don't put them on the agenda. Same with committees. Unless your bylaws state that at every meeting, certain committees or officers must report, only put on the agenda the actual individuals and committees that need to report. Special committees are always handled separately. Special committees are different from standing committees in that standing committees stand literally from year to year so they continue in existence special committees are created for special purposes so they can last for a number of years but typically they're not listed in the bylaws and they're very specific functions so if you have a special committee on fundraising for instance this is where they would report i mentioned special orders if your bylaws state that every annual meeting there shall be board elections or at the May meeting, the assembly shall elect board members. That's a special order. So this is the placement in the agenda where it would go. And special orders can also be created at previous meetings. Um, again, another advanced parliamentary topic that we can talk about at another time. I put here as an example, um, something that would go under unfinished business. So let's say in our September meeting, we discussed bylaws, but we weren't quite ready to vote on on that particular bylaw change. At the meeting in September, we could postpone the discussion and vote on that amendment to the October meeting. And this is the placement where it would show up in the October meeting. 
And then if we had new business, an example could be to hire a new web designer. So hopefully here you can see the relationship between an order of business, which would be appropriate to go into your bylaws, and a specific meeting agenda, which would not be appropriate to go into your bylaws. Agendas are developed from orders of business. If you want to place an order of business in your bylaws, that's fine, but you shouldn't put an agenda in your bylaws because then you would have to amend your bylaws every time you had a meeting, which would not be effective. Common meeting obstacles. So meetings that start or end late. Meetings where no real action is taken. Information is too much or not enough. Participants are uninformed. One person dominates all discussion and weak leadership in presiding. I think um, it's fair to say um, that we've all experienced at least one or maybe multiple um, of these common meeting obstacles. And as you create rules or think about ways to be more effective in your meetings, take a look at how these particular issues could be resolved. If your meetings start or end late, really understanding how to adjourn a meeting or how to um, change the rules of debate could be helpful. If no real action is taken, maybe you need to adopt an agenda or an order of business to make your meetings a little more effective. If information is too much or not enough, you could certainly set limits on the amount of time an individual has to present, or you could, per your rules, request that all reports are submitted a week in advance. So as you think about your obstacles, your organization should think of rules to help overcome those obstacles so that the obstacles are no longer challenges. Within a meeting, everyone has a role. Um, there are two necessary officers. Based on how large an organization is, you'll have more officers or more members. Um, but in the basic, very small environment, the necessary mandatory officers are a presiding officer and a secretary. A presiding officer, um, obviously the president, or if you're in a committee capacity, the committee chairperson is the one who presides. So they're necessary to determine who speaks, which motions get processed, so on and so forth. A secretary, their job is to keep the minutes. So this is something that's also a concern in the parliamentary community um, in that a lot of organizations are starting to record their meetings because it's so easy um, via Zoom or Google or whatever um, platform that you use. But a recording is not a transcript um, a recording, excuse me, is a transcript. It's a video transcript of what was done, but it's not minutes. Minutes are simply a record of what was done. I'm not an attorney, but for a number of reasons, it's probably not advisable to record entire meetings and use those as minutes. Minutes are simply, here are the motions that were passed. Here are the ones that failed. Here's the time that we started the meeting. Here's the time that we ended the meeting. There could be an entire presentation just on minutes. But if there's a takeaway from this um, slide, just use caution when recording meetings. And definitely, you don't want to substitute recordings as minutes. A parliamentarian is not necessary, but can be helpful in your meetings. Parliamentarians simply assist the presiding officer with procedure. When I serve as a presiding officer, my sole focus is on procedure. So not the merits of debate or discussion or anything that's happening other than is Roberts being followed or the bylaws being followed. So having someone just focused on that can be very helpful. And as we all know, appointed and elected officers can help with ensuring fairness during meetings. Members are the reason why we have meetings. So members are the most important you know, people within a meeting. They're the ones who bring business and deliberate and they debate and remember those four basic rights of attending meetings, um, making motions, debating and voting. That's the role of the members. Members express their views by voting. So if they're in favor of what's being presented, they vote it up. If they're not in favor, they vote it down. Members also have a role in helping to ensure that the assembly is protected from disruptive members or even from abusive chairs who may be exceeding their authority. Um, members should know a little bit about procedures so that they can protect the rights of other members and their rights. So again, just don't leave it to your officers to manage the meeting. 
members should also feel empowered to participate and to speak up when things go um, go um, the way they shouldn't. So here is a video that I just can't stop showing. So I'll give you a little um, background first. This video isn't meant for entertainment purposes or to um, obviously um, chastise these individuals who I don't know, but it just happens to be a video that's publicly available, probably because in Florida they have sunshine laws that require recordings to be taken and shared. But I want you all to take a look at this video and then we'll have a brief discussion after via the chat on what you think based on everything we've talked about so far with regard to the rights of members, um, order, um, fairness, all of these concepts that we've been talking about. Can we do better? There's always things that pop up that we can do better on. Um, and I call the question. I'm sorry, that's not how this works. We each have an opportunity to speak five minutes. I believe I thought we did. Yeah, the question has been called. So, no, I'm sorry. We've been and that's turn. not how calling the question works. You need a second and you need to vote. Can I have a second? For calling the are question? you telling me that you're going to keep me from talking right now? You've talked all evening. Look, all look evening. here. You're calling me disrespectful because I've interrupted people. But this gentleman has turned off people's lights in the middle of a global health pandemic. That's what that gentleman did. Point of and order. And you think I'm disrespectful when you're wrapping Point of order. This gentleman point has the ability to do a number of things. Point we could have banked large gatherings. We could have closed the beach. We could have put a moratorium on 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 I on recessed the meeting. I recessed the Also meeting. not within your power, and the attorney the has held that that's true. I recessed the meeting. Can we do better? So. Um, in that particular situation, and I will go to the chat now, but love your thoughts on, you know, what you thought, who was in control, who was presiding, what things were going well in that meeting, what things were not. Um, there were a lot of issues and there are a lot of assumptions we have to make, but I think we all can assume in that particular circumstance that there wasn't really defined process and the individuals weren't working together and that there was a lot of chaos with regard to their proceedings. So in the chat, what are your thoughts around that situation? Yeah, I think from her gavel, she probably was the presiding officer. Um, I don't think she was in control, unfortunately. Definitely chaotic. Um, yeah, someone has sent me a private message that I won't repeat, but um, I agree. Um, yeah, lack of control for sure. And again, that wasn't meant to embarrass anyone in that video or for entertainment purposes, but I've been in meetings like that and it wasn't a good feeling. And I think when you don't have structure, that's how any meeting can spiral into. And it's not helpful for anyone, unfortunately, it seemed like those individuals were actually making some pretty significant decisions on behalf of their constituents. So, you know, this quote is from the Robert in Robert's Rules of Order, Henry Robert, when there is no law, but every man does what is right in his own eyes, there is the least of real liberty. So something to think about. At this point, if you're reviewing the presentation at a later date, um, I would highly encourage that you take a look at that video, think about everything up to this point and have a breakout and discuss common meeting obstacles that you may have faced in your meetings. If you're viewing this live, I would love for us to continue the discussion in the chat, maybe list confidentially some difficult situations you've been a part of, and we can discuss those during the discussion at the end. So again, the exercise here is simply to reflect on difficult meeting obstacles and then we can talk about ways to overcome them. I know particularly in that video, if I was advising that organization, there are a number of rules we could put in place to ensure that their next meeting went a little better. Next, we're gonna move on to transacting business. And we know that motions are the primary method by which we transact business. There was a question in the chat on will these slides be available? Yes, the slides will be available. So hopefully no one's attempting to screenshot. Um, you don't have to, these will be emailed out, they're yours. And I hope that you'll get some value out of them even after the presentation. But moving on to the next right of members, we know that members are entitled to attend meetings and they're also entitled to make motions. They don't have to make motions, they can't be compelled to make motions, but they certainly have the right to make motions. 
there are five primary classifications of motions in Roberts. There are main motions, subsidiary motions, privileged motions, incidental motions, and bring back motions. And each classification of motions, of motion, excuse me, has a very specific function. Main motions introduce new business before the assembly. It's probably the most common type of motion. So I move to amend the budget um, line item 14, or I move to change the headquarters from Brooklyn to Queens, or I move to adjourn the meeting. Those are all examples of main motions. Even though it's the lowest ranking motion, it's probably the most versatile because anything could be a main motion in theory. So it's unlimited in its variety, but as a classification, it's the lowest ranking. Next, we have subsidiary motions. Subsidiary motions assist assemblies in treating or disposing of a main motion or sometimes other motions. And they're ranked five through 12 out of the 13 ranking motions, which I will show in a later slide. But motions like the motion to amend the bylaws or amend a motion or limit or extend the limits of debate are all examples of subsidiary motions. Next, we have privileged motions. So those would be motions such as call for orders of the day or a question of privilege, even the motion to recess, so take a brief break. Those are all examples of privileged motions and those are ranked the highest out of the 13 ranking motions. Then we get into two classifications that are not ranked. Incidental motions have no rank because they relate in different ways to the pending business. So let's say someone makes a motion um, that is in conflict with the bylaws. Another member or even the chair could raise a point of order, and that would be an example of an incidental motion because it's related to a breach that is happening right then and there. Um, a member couldn't raise a point of order unless there's a breach. So it, it, it takes that specific um, situation to activate a incidental motion. And because of that, they have no rank. Bring back motions or motions that bring a question again before the assembly are motions that allow the assembly to consider the merits of a question that has previously been disposed of in some way. So let's say we, um, going back to our mock agenda, um, choose to hire a web designer, and we later find out that the web designer um, can't fit our needs. We could potentially make a motion to reconsider that contract and to hire a new contractor um, to build our web page or do our web design. So that would be an example of um, a motion that brings a question again before the assembly. As promised, here are those 13 ranking motions that I talked about. And all of these motions have a specific function. That's the reason why there are specific motions. The first five are the privileged motions. So fix the time which to adjourn. Just the brief intermission um, that's scheduled formally during a meeting, raise a question of privilege, um, could be something that allows for um, let's say there's a noisy fan in the meeting hall, someone could raise a question of privilege with regard to turning the fan off or turning the mic up on a speaker. Call for orders of the day allows for the agenda to be followed. So each of these ranking motions have a definite rank, and the way it works is the lower numbers can be superseded by the higher numbers. So if we have a main motion, which is number 13, the motion to amend can take precedence over that motion. And we would deal with the motion to amend before we finalize the main motion. But we're gonna look at main motions due to time limitations tonight only. And there's six steps to process a main motion. This is a key takeaway, six steps across two parts. On the left-hand side, we have bringing the motion before the assembly. On the right-hand side, we have consideration of the motion. And we'll start with the left-hand side. So there's three steps on both parts or on bringing a motion before an assembly. Once a member has recognition, so the chair formally recognized that individual, they're allowed to make a motion. So let's take a basic motion, um, one that we've probably all dealt with, 
And this is a motion um, dealing with money. In this case, I move that we donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. Very simple, non-controversial motion. If it receives a second, the chair can then state it. If it does not receive a second, then the motion dies and the assembly simply doesn't process it. This is also another way to speed up and make your meetings a little more effective. Um, a lot of organizations, and this isn't um, necessarily a bad thing, but it's not correct from a parliamentary standpoint. A lot of organizations will discuss matters and then bring a motion um, only for the motion to fail or to understand later that no one wanted to discuss the motion other than the mover. If you follow the process of doing the reverse, which is what Roberts and the other parliamentary authorities instruct, which is bring the motion first, if it has a second, then debate it, then you'll find that some motions never receive a second and you don't have to waste time discussing them. So once again, if it receives a second, you move on. If it doesn't receive a second, the motion dies right then, and then you move on to something else. But assuming our motion, and I'll go back so you can see what the motion is, to donate $1,000 receives a second, the chair would then state for the benefit of everyone in the meeting, it is moved and seconded that we donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. Here's how that looks in script form. I highly advise anybody presiding um, to develop a script or work with a parliamentarian to have a script develop. Um, it definitely keeps meetings on track, but here's how it looks in script. We must call that member, member A. They seek recognition. They state once they have the floor that I move that we donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. Another member, we call that member, member B, would second or could second. And then the chair would state it is moved and seconded that we donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. Are you ready for the question? It's important to note after a member brings a question, um, a proposal rather, and another member seconds, the chair is obligated to state that question. It's not a choice by the chair on if the question will be stated. He or she must state the question. After the question is stated, we move on to consideration of the question. And this is where members get a chance to debate the chair puts the question to a vote and then announces the result of the vote. So debate is essentially just a discussion, the whole purpose of bringing the proposal before the assembly. You know, Individuals can rise to speak in favor of the motion. They can rise to speak in opposition to the motion. Again, protecting the rights of the majority and the minority. Everyone has an opportunity to speak and they're entitled to do so or to be silent. After everyone has had an opportunity to speak who wishes to speak, the question is then put to a vote. That means it must be disposed of. At this point, either it's voted up or it's voted down. And then after the result of the vote, the chair states for the benefit of everyone clearly whether the motion has passed or failed and what the organization will or will not do. So let's go back to our script. We know from the first part that a member rose, they made a motion to um, donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. There was a second. The chair then stated the motion and members went into debate. The question, um, are you ready for the question, is simply the chair assuring the assembly that if you wish to continue discussing this matter, we can. If not, we're going to vote. So that question comes up, are you ready for the question? The chair will state, if everyone's ready to proceed, that the question is on the motion that we donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. All those in favor say aye, which is calling for the affirmative vote. All those opposed say no, which is calling for the negative vote. And then the chair would announce, if the ayes have it, the affirmative, that the ayes have it and the motion is adopted, we will donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. Or if the motion fails, that the noes have it and the motion is lost, we will not donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. And here's how that complete sequence looks. This is the proper way to process a motion. A member seeks recognition, has the floor, states their proposal. In this case, we're gonna stick with moving to donate $1,000 to a nonprofit. Another member was second. The chair was state for the benefit of everyone. It is moved and seconded that we donate $1,000 to a nonprofit and then ask, are you ready for the question, which is an invitation for debate. The members would then have an opportunity to speak 
in favor of the motion or to speak in opposition, the chair um, would check to see if there's any additional debate at some point by asking again, are you ready for the question? If members would like to continue debating, then they continue debating. But if they're done debating, the motion is processed in its entirety. So the question would be on the proposal, which is donating $1,000 to a nonprofit. All those in favor would vote in the affirmative, in this case, by voice, which is I. And then all those opposed would vote in the negative, which would be no. And the chair would announce um, whether the ayes have it and the motion passes or the noes have it and the motion is lost. So debate is something that is very critical in a deliberative assembly. I think it's something that's also very underutilized in a lot of our assemblies. A lot of individual state opinions instead of defined arguments. And we know that debate is a regulated discussion um, between two matched sides. From a legal standpoint, it's the formal discussion of a motion before a deliberative body according to the rules of parliamentary procedure. So exactly what we're talking about. Using the four right, basic rights of membership, we know that debate, debate is one of those things that a member is entitled to. So we're going to talk a little bit about some tips and tricks of how to make your debate a little more effective. So parliamentary procedure allows for the fair exchange of ideas. In meetings, it's never acceptable to attack people. It's always acceptable to attack ideas. You definitely want to take the personalities out of it because that only leads to hard feelings and unfortunately a lot of the behavior we saw in that video the brief video that we saw which goes on for quite some time after that and it only gets worse personal attacks can create friction we don't want that in our meetings and debate is healthy when done correctly and definitely informative the 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 whole point of having a debate is to persuade other individuals and sometimes you could go into a debate with one view and you could be persuaded if the information is persuasive factors that may impact debate speaking limits the quorum parliamentary strategy which is good parliamentary deception which is bad and then unfortunately confusion so if the chair is struggling to lead the meeting or members are unsure what they're voting on that could definitely disrupt debate. But, you know, a challenge I would have, and once again, I would encourage you all to go to the chat, do we really debate? I think far too many people do not. Some are just afraid of speaking, which is a natural thing. A lot of people have a fear of speaking, but that shouldn't hold you back from debate. Sometimes our newer members um, are afraid to speak up because they're new in the organization. Friendships are a reality of life. Um, we like to work with our colleagues and we develop friendships and sometimes we don't want to disrupt that. Factions, unfortunately, the politics of belonging in an organization can get in the way. And agenda-driven chairmanship, unfortunately, are all matters that um, could stop us all at various points from deliberating. I would encourage each of you, however, to do so because that's your right as a member and you want to bring your ideas and your expertise to your organizations. So let's go back to that motion, the motion that we donate a thousand dollars to a nonprofit. There's many reasons to be in favor of that motion and they're all listed there. But the key takeaway here is that those wishing um, for the motion to be adopted must tell the assembly how it helps members as individuals as well as the organization. If not, time is wasted and meetings aren't really being effective. In an organization, that $1,000 belongs to everyone. So as a member, if you want to be effective, you should really state why you're in favor of that motion if you're speaking in debate. Same for those opposed. There's a number of reasons why you could be opposed to that particular motion. Um, you want to make sure that you have a strong case, strong arguments, and really tell the organization how it harms members in this case um, as individuals as well as an organization. And we'll go into a few examples. So the key thing here is to make the case. You want to not just express opinions, but you want to really build an argument and be persuasive in your argument so that you get some of those individuals who are on the opposing side to agree with you or some of the people who are neutral to really believe into your proposal and to vote with you. Here's the framework. This isn't in Roberts, but it's a parliamentary framework that's used in parliamentary debate. And it's called ARIES. It's simply assertion, reasoning, evidence, and significance. And I am fairly certain 
if you utilize this framework in your discussions, you'll have a lot of success in persuading people to vote with you and to um, make your discussions during meetings a little more effective. So an assertion is simply a confident and forceful statement. If we look at that proposal, let's say we're voting in favor of it, you could have the assertion that assisting nonprofit organizations is aligned with the goal of the organization. Or a strong reason, reasoning is the action of thinking about something in a logical way. So really just being logical. In this case, you could state our bylaws. You could use the bylaws as a reason to believe in this proposal. Our bylaws clearly state that the organization should support other charitable organizations in the community. You could provide some evidence which really elevates an opinion um, to an argument. So present some facts to strengthen your opinion and make it an argument. In this case, you could provide evidence that each year for the past 12 years, we've allocated $1,000 to a local nonprofit. And then significance, the quality of being worthy of attention, really the importance of why it matters. You could close with keeping with the spirit of our bylaws and the custom of the organization to share, the assembly should adopt this motion. So assertion, reasoning, evidence, significance. If I had more time, I could tell you of how my son used this on me to get a cell phone. Um, he must have been listening to my parliamentary calls. Very effective, but assertion, reasoning, evidence, and significance can improve your arguments in your meetings and in life. So once again, we have you know, this point where the chair is putting the question to a vote. And I ask you, go to the chat, who makes the best case? Member C, who simply rises and states that we should donate $1,000 to a nonprofit because we've always done so? Or member D, who rises and says, assisting nonprofit organizations is aligned with a goal of the organization, our bylaws clearly state that the organization should support other charitable organizations in the community. Each year for the past 12 years, we have allocated $1,000 to a local nonprofit, keeping with the spirit of our bylaws and custom of the organization to share, the assembly should adopt this motion. Member D only spoke for 15 seconds, and I was talking a little fast, but let's call it 30 seconds. It really doesn't take that much additional time to really build out your argument and really build the case. I don't think there's anything wrong with what member C stated, but member D really persuaded me. Same for opposition. So we have member E who simply states we shouldn't do it. We should not donate the money. But we have member F who's calling out that the organization's over budget, that the organization's over budget by $2,000, that the bylaws state that we should, not that we must, and you know, voting no will allow the organization to not only save money, but allow the organization to donate collective time. Again, another 20, 25 seconds to go to extra mile can really lead to more persuasive discussion and a better decision for the organization. One of my favorite quotes, if a debate if in debate, excuse me, a member is permitted to speak 10 minutes, he is permitted to speak two minutes, but is prohibited from speaking 12 minutes. And I love this quote because it just really speaks to the absurd nature of rules. What I take away from this and why I use this, that it really doesn't matter what your rules are, just make rules you will follow. And if you want members to speak less, make a rule where members can only speak for a certain amount of time. If you want members to speak longer, you can create a rule that allows for that as well. So here's another breakout if you're looking at this at a later time. Um, Again, practice making motions. The time to practice making motions and practice that Aries framework for debate is not during the meeting. You want to use it during the meeting. Obviously, you want to practice that prior to the meeting. So we know that we have our steps to process a motion. Once we get through debate, that individuals are going to use this framework that they just learned, or maybe some of you have already been using it, which is great. So you're going to be really persuasive. We know that after all the debate is done and there's vigorous discussion that's informed and lots of evidence that the chair is gonna put the question to a vote. So we have to vote. And this will be the last part of the presentation because voting is the last of the basic rights of membership. Every member is entitled to vote, but obviously not obligated to vote. So we know that one person, one vote goes back to that notion of equality. It's a fundamental principle 
that whether you're the oldest member in your organization or the newest member, the presiding officer or the treasurer, you only get one vote. The common ways, the five most common ways to vote are by voice. So saying I or no, that's calling for the affirmative or the negative. Rising, so you can simply get a visual look. That doesn't work so well for virtual meetings, but you could simply rise in order to vote. You could do a show of hands in large assembly halls. That works well. Roll call for small boards. Or if your bylaws prescribe a ballot, which is a paper or electronic method of actually taking a vote. A tie vote is not a majority. Um, we know that the majority is more than half. So it's important that if you have 100 people and 50 vote for and 50 vote against, you understand that motion fails. Always call for the affirmative first, then the negative. It's necessary, it's not necessary, excuse me, to call for extensions. It is the right of members to vote. It's not an obligation. So individuals don't have to vote if they choose not to. Ballot voting must take place when prescribed by the bylaws. Um, this comes up a lot in elections. Let's say there's only one candidate. Um, individuals will go, well, we don't have to vote by ballot because there's only one. If your bylaw states you have to vote by ballot, you do. Simple tip there is change your bylaws to allow for some flexibility. And it's the duty of all members to ensure votes are counted correctly. Once again, just revisiting this piece around majority, two thirds and unanimous. Um, we won't spend much additional time on it, but just use caution when you have rules that require anything more than a majority. Obviously two thirds is a majority because it's greater than half. But the higher you go, the more you give power and rights to a minority of individuals to actually defeat a proposal. All right, so that brings us to the end. Um, I really appreciate everyone's attention. It's very hard to do this via webinar, but I hope that from the comments um, being an indication that you saw some value in this. We're always our best resources, so feel free to reach out to me and to your colleagues. Um, for information and best practices. Rules are just rules, custom also matters. So you wanna build in cultural norms into your rules and behaviors. Robertsrules.com has a lot of great debate and discussion. I would highly suggest anyone wanting to know more about procedure to take a look at that. Parliamentarians.org is a great resource. Um, that's the National Association of Parliamentarians website, as well as the American Institute of Parliamentarians. And I host all of my articles, as I mentioned on Medium. Um, all of these links will be shared in addition to the presentation after this presentation. So thank you, my information, which will be included. And I believe that brings us to the discussion. So at this point, I'm going to ask for the assistance of Sarah um, to guide us through. Some things to help frame this discussion are democracy. How do we get more of it in our meetings? Those five principles, order, equality, justice, minority rights, and majority rule and reflecting on what you learn. You know, if we were in person, we would just go around the room and talk about all of these topics. But as you start to form your questions, I'll leave this up and then we can use it as a basis for our discussion. So Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Every time I listen to you, I learn something new and maybe <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll master this. My first, qu the first question that came out is, what is a consent agenda? and how can it be used? I'm sorry, I had to go grab my copy of Robert's Rules of Order because I've never seen a consent agenda. I'm just joking. So a consent agenda <laughs> is one of those quick parliamentary tools that allows for individuals to adopt agendas in mass or to adopt um, items that are non-controversial in mass. So if you know you're going to approve the minutes, you know you're going to approve certain committee reports, and you know you're going to approve a certain slate of officers, throw it all on a consent agenda and adopt all of those things at once. There's no reason why you need to go through each of those individually if you can adopt them together. Some key takeaways from consent agenda, if any member objects to any item on a consent agenda, just pull that item out and then vote on the other pieces and take that one item individually. So hopefully that answers your question. Very valuable tool. Happy to share some additional information around it, but it's something I, I hope more organizations use. Thank you. We had a number of questions about minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, some asked, 
Well, let's see. Um, how do you correct minutes? So minutes can be corrected at any point, um, even by members who were not at the meeting. Minutes are not adopted, minutes are approved. And the assumption, the parliamentary assumption is that they're approved with necessary corrections. For instance, let's say you were at a meeting and the minutes reflect that you were not. Obviously, you know that you were. And at the meeting where the minutes were adopted, you weren't there, so you didn't have an opportunity to correct it. At three meetings later, 10 minutes, meetings later, you could move to correct the minutes. So move to um, update that correction. So you simply make a motion. Remember, going back to our agenda, minutes are usually the first thing to be discussed. You could rise, get the attention of the presiding officer, offer an amendment to those minutes, and they could be approved with that necessary correction. Um, it's something where you don't want a um, error to persist for too long. So the sooner you can look at the minutes and approve it, the easier it is to get that done. It would require a vote, however. So for instance, let's say you weren't at the meeting and there's a requirement in your bylaws that you have to attend a certain number of meetings. You simply just couldn't move to amend the minutes to magically be at the meeting. Um, you could make the motion, but the assembly would have to self-police and agree that you were at that meeting and agree to that change. Oh, and then tagging on to that, another question was, can a member vote on minutes of a meeting that they had not attended? Yes. Yes, they can. Now, that's personally a rule that I do not agree with, but committee meetings, regular meetings, there's there's no separation. A member has those four basic rights to attend meetings, to um, make motions, to debate, and to vote on all matters. So simply being in the room at the time the vote is presented, unless there's another rule, which I haven't seen a rule that says you can only vote on minutes unless you were at the meeting, anyone can vote on it. And as I mentioned, anyone can correct the minutes, even if they weren't at that meeting. And let's think about the fairness behind that. So let's say you and I are at the meeting or previous meetings and I inform you that I'm going to a meeting and you tell me that you're not able to make it, Sarah, but there is a correction you want me to make on your behalf. I think that's a fair democratic thing to do because you can't make the change. I can make it on your behalf, so to speak, or at least bring it up. That's the reason why any member, even if they weren't at the meeting, can make an amendment to the minutes or vote on something that they weren't a part of. Thank you. Um, a question in the chat, again, with the minutes. Um, who owns the minutes? Um, I'll read it to you. Can you correct grammar and spelling? I had a town clerk tell me the meeting minutes were hers and not the board's. I disagree <laughs> with her. Do you concur? So every parliamentarian will always tell you the answer to any question you ask is it depends so <laughs> without seeing the bylaws um it's hard to say however it would be highly unusual for any organization even a municipality to state that the minutes belong to the clerk or the secretary the minutes belong to the organization because the minutes are the official record of the organization as such, any member, as we just discussed, can make an amendment or change to correct the minutes. That's why the organization itself approves the minutes. If what that individual was saying is true, then he or she alone would be responsible for not only drafting the minutes, but also approving them, which, again, is possible, um, but very unlikely. Okay, um, two questions. What's the proper way for an organization to adopt Robert's rules? Um, and should a, is a parliamentarian, can they be a member of the board? Great question. So I'll take the last one first. Um, a parliamentarian can absolutely be a member of the board. Any member or officer or role can be a member of the board as long as your bylaws authorize it. And that also leads into the first part of the question. Most organizations adopt a parliamentary authority in the bylaws. Otherwise, they can adopt it if they don't have bylaws via a special rule. 
So they would simply make a resolution, whether it's a board resolution or a standing rule in the committee to go, that goes, Robert's rules of order newly revised will be our parliamentary authority. Thank so you. did I answer both parts of those questions? I think you did. And if not, please send us questions and we'll answer it later. Um, and, and on that point, not to cut you off, but on that point, um, not only does the presiding officer have a duty of impartiality, the parliamentarian also has a duty of impartiality. So even if the parliamentarian is a, a member, as we talked about, they have the right to attend meetings, they have the right to debate, they have the right to make motions, all of that in the vote. That doesn't apply to parliamentarians because their sole focus is to advise impartially on procedure. So while they have the right, they give up that right by serving in the role. So that's important to note. Um, typically, if the parliamentarian is on your board, um, they serve as a non-voting member of that board, even though they're a board member. So they have the rights and privileges other than speaking in debate, making motions, and voting. Is usually what I advise and usually what works well. I just think it would be very difficult for your parliamentarian <laughs> to argue against you in debate. You know, that could kind of lead to some mistrust on if you're on the opposite side of your parliamentarian and with later motions. So that's a good best practice to make sure they're non-voting. Um, I we have a bunch of questions that have to do with what happens when people are rude. <laughs> um, how do you limit discussion and cut somebody off tactfully? What happens if somebody is over speaking the chair and refuse to stop? Um, what happens if a member of the public won't adhere to the three minutes um, timing, let's say? Yeah, um, this is unfortunate because I, I personally have observed virtual meetings, hybrid meetings, allowing for a lot of this behavior um, to unfortunately um, be displayed. We saw a little bit of it in the video, but it's happening in a lot of our organizations. Unfortunately, just like we cannot stop individuals in our society from doing certain things, um, this is the same in our meetings. Unless your rules give the assembly authority to mute a member, for instance, that's something a lot of organizations um, had difficulty with. You just can't mute someone because you don't like what they're saying or because they're speaking over the speaking time unless you adopt a rule that allows you to do that. So as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, think about all of these common meeting obstacles and then write rules so you can actually manage. You know, This presentation is about effective meetings. You wanna manage that behavior of all your members so that you can actually enforce the rules. But if you don't have a rule that says at the three minute mark on our Zoom calls, you're gonna automatically be muted you can't do that. Um, unfortunately, if you don't have a rule, the proper procedure would be for the chair to request that the member stop, to request a second time, to enter on the minutes, the behavior of the member, and then to actually bring up charges on the member um, where discipline would be issued by those present very difficult procedure. Um, one, you definitely want a parliamentarian to help you with, but effectively the assembly would vote at that time whether to remove the member or not. But you still have the issue of would the individual leave? Um, it gets really complicated. So I think diplomacy is the best approach because when you get really technical like that, it usually doesn't end well. But you know, if you have good rules on the front and you can help limit a lot of that. So probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but there's no rule that can replace common sense or bad manners, unfortunately. Okay, and then just one more on this sort of, what happens when a board member continues to bring up a previous vote they've lost? Is there a rule of how many times a vote can be revisited? It depends. <laughs> I told you <laughs> I would say that. Um, in one meeting, so let's say we're in the October meeting. Once it's done, it's done. The only way you can bring it back, remember that bring back motion would be a motion to reconsider. Um, very interesting process, but it can be done. If we're in October meeting and it fails, that individual has the 100% full right to bring it up at the November meeting. 
And that's just the way parliamentary procedure works. You know, that goes back to that protecting the rights of the minority. They could be the only individual who wants to review that proposal. Or maybe it's two individuals, you know, they have the individual and then there's a second, but they have the absolute right to bring it up again at the next meeting. Thank you. Um, we got a lot of questions about abstentions. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, how are abstentions counted? Does the chair uh, of the committee need to abstain? Um, conflict of interest in abstaining? Um, anything you can share would be appreciated. Oh my goodness, you all are asking the tough questions tonight, but all very good questions. So if I miss anything, please um, bring it back up because I'm gonna address all of those. So first and foremost, on conflict of interest, unless you have a specific rule, you can't force someone not to vote, even if there's a personal conflict. Now, it's advised that they do so, and it's advised that you have a rule that states that. If there's, let's say, go back to our web designer. You know, someone on the board has a web firm, um, that they recuse themselves. That could be a rule, but absent a rule, they should recuse, but you can't force them because they have those four basic rights. So if you wanna ensure that conflicts aren't addressed with the person creating the conflict, create a rule to address that. Absentee votes, um, this is a very sticky topic for a number of reasons, they don't count. So let's take our group of 100, 100 individuals. And there's 100 people, we have our quorum, one person votes in the affirmative, and zero people vote in the negative. Everyone else abstains. The motion passes. The reason why is it's a majority of those present and voting. You can't force someone to vote. Again, this is a democracy. If someone wants to come to a meeting and not exercise their right, that is their right to do so. But when it comes to the vote, it's only those who are present at the meeting and actually taking part in the vote. So that's something you definitely want to get a hold of. There are a lot of elections that are incorrectly um, won or lost based on abstentions, and abstentions simply don't count. So again, to be crystal clear, if you have 10 individuals and six vote in favor, four vote against, the motion passes. If you have 10 individuals, three vote in favor, one votes against, motion still passes because a majority, in this case, three to one, that's a majority. Even with the remaining six who abstain, their votes simply don't count. Okay. Um, let's see. We have so many good questions here and not enough time. <laughs> yeah. Um, what does lay on the table mean? Yes. So lay on the table. This is one of those confusing motions that a lot of individuals confuse with um, what we do in our um, U.S. Congress. So the table of measure in that sense is to kill it. So basically, um, it just goes away. Um, it could come back at a later time, but that's basically what it's used for there. In the parliamentary sense, to lay on the table means to temporarily lay aside. So there's two ways to lay something aside. One is to postpone it to another meeting. Lay on the table could be that um, you're in a meeting and you have um, a guest speaker, the mayor of your town show up a little bit early and we're in the middle of taking um, a committee report. We could lay that committee report on the table. So lay it on the side so we could allow that um, individual to speak. And once that individual was done speaking, we could take it from the table to resume the business. So lay on the table indicates that you're actually gonna come back to it, not that it goes and it dies. That's actually the motion, motion to postpone indefinitely, which is the closest thing to actually tabling where you vote on it and you postpone it to the point where you're never gonna revisit it. Oh boy. So much to remember. Good thing there's a book. There, there is. There is. Both versions explain that very well. The yellow one, the in brief, and obviously the long. There's a whole section dedicated to lay on the table that is worth reading because it's a very valuable motion. Thank you. 
Um, do you include public comments in a, well, no, I know that, well, what about public comments in a meeting um, on agenda? I don't really quite understand that, but I guess you can have um, public comments on your agenda, correct? As a, a so I'll answer it both ways. I'll answer your question and what I heard out of that. Yes, um, if you're in a committee setting or a meeting where public um, testimony or comments are part of the agenda, um, you absolutely can include those in the minutes. If you are a municipality or an institution that allows public interaction, you can have on your agenda a section either under new business or committee reports where the public can make commentary. In the actual minutes, and this is just a general statement, I would strongly advise everyone not to include comments, minutes, or a record of what was done, not what was said. And, you know, sometimes things just are taken out of context during a debate. You could be speaking hypothetically. And now you're, if you put it in your minutes, someone could take that snapshot of your hypothetical argument and use it in a very negative way. So on the agenda, yes, you can schedule and invite guests and have whoever you want to speak in your meetings. In the minutes, I wouldn't take down specific comments from the public or individuals unless it was part of an actual committee report. So let's say you're taking public commentary on a new structure in your library, that certainly would be valid to go into a committee report, but not the minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm confused and so is somebody in the Q&A. Are seconds still required for all motions? And what about something coming out of committee? No, um, seconds are required for all motions unless they come from a committee. The reason why committees do not require a second is because most committees, not all, um, have two or more people. So if it's coming from the committee, a second is assumed because at least two people on the committee um, recommended it. Same with boards. So if your board brings something, um, it's assumed that a second is implied. So you skip that step of having a second. Most people will offer a second anyway, but if it comes from a committee or a board, it does not require a second if that committee has two or more people. Um, I guess diplomacy is coming here as well, and I think you've addressed it before. Um, when submitting minutes, how is it handled if a member asks to have the minutes reflect a certain point? And we need to have that go on our heads over and over again, repeated. So that particular point is actually a question of privilege. So if you remember that ranking list of motions, when you get the presentation, go back to that, there's number four, which is a question of privilege. And it is a question of privilege to have a certain statement entered into the minutes. So I like to go on the record that I oppose this motion. That certainly can happen, um, but the assembly would have to agree to it. I think often individuals say, and they assume that it will simply just go into the minutes. And in properly constructed minutes, that those are notes, those are annotations. That's not an official action. For it actually go to go into the minutes, it would need to be voted on by the assembly, and it certainly could happen, but it would need to be voted on. Thank you. Um, does voting on resolutions become part of special orders? It could. So if we vote on a resolution, let's say we're still in our meeting and we want to have another training on parliamentary procedure at the next meeting and make it a special order, that is actually a motion. So as part of the entire motion, you would make the action a special order. And at the next meeting, it would rise to that level of importance where at a certain time in the agenda, you would have to do it. Thank you. Um, somebody wrote that they've been doing roll call votes during Zoom meetings. Is there a better way or an alternative way to do that that doesn't put people on the spot? So roll call votes, unfortunately, by definition, they put people on the spot. Um, you don't have to do roll call votes. There's a number of software applications that I use. One is Election Buddy, the other is Election Runner that allow for electronic balloting. So you know individuals voted, but not who voted or how they voted. 
And if you have concerns with everyone, every vote being a roll call, I would say probably stop doing that and use one of those electronic platforms to conduct your voting. I wouldn't recommend a Zoom polling feature because it's not clear always who's on the Zoom, nor is there any type of paper trail that would allow you to verify the vote. Again, election buddy and election runner allow for you to audit the vote. You see who voted, but not how they voted. Um, it's a really good tool. Those are two very good tools. Thank you. Um, we're just about done in time. Um, and questions that haven't been answered, we will get answers back because these are great questions. But the one that I need to ask is, sure. Peter wants to know, did your son get a phone? He did. And I'll, I'll, I I got to share this. I know we have a minute left, um, but he asked for a phone. I said, no. He asked for a phone. He asked my wife. She said, no. He asked. And then one day he said, dad, you know, and we live in the city. You know, I'm going to high school and I'm riding a lot on the train and, you know, for my safety. And if something happened, you certainly will want to know what happened when I'm on the train. So for that reason, I think out of safety and out of communication, ease of communication, I should get a phone. And I said, you know what, son, I think you're going to get that phone. So, yes, he got the phone <laughs> by using Aries. I was proud. <laughs> But I also realized I needed more soundproofing in my condo because he was listening a little too closely in <laughs> all my calls. So <laughs> that's wonderful. Rebecca, Sarah, I'll put it over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, Rebecca put a lot of helpful library information in the chat also, so please refer to that for more library specific guidance um, when you're reviewing this. As a reminder, slides are going to go out. This is recorded and is going to be archived. Rebecca, do you want to share where that's going to be so people can find out on your website? Yeah, absolutely. So this will be archived with the rest of the trustee handbook book club recordings if folks are curious about that or are not from the public library world we have a lot of folks here from school and academic libraries as well tonight uh, the link is in the chat box uh, and you're welcome to uh, access that everyone who's registered though will get a, a recording the link to the i'm sorry the attachment of the slides and the other resources that adrian mentioned here tonight we will be after this drawing for the um, gracious uh, Adrian has given us with meetings with him. So we are working out a way to get winners for those and we'll be announcing that very shortly. So look for that too. And again, Adrian, I just wanna thank you. We've gotten such great feedback, both in the chat and everything. And I think this was extremely helpful to library staff, directors, and especially trustees that are with us tonight. So thank you again, Adrian. Thank you. My pleasure to present to you all. And if there's ever an opportunity to do so in the future, I'd be happy to do so or volunteer someone from the association to provide something on motions or minutes or whatever your needs are. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll be sending out information shortly. Bye, everyone.